a presentation of agriculture market situation and outlook. Um, Want to go over just a couple ground rules for everyone, please, and that's keep your video and microphones off so there's no interruption. And um, later you'll find out that you can add questions at the end to the chat. You can text or email the email on the screen. Um, but please try not to use your microphone or camera. We appreciate that. All right. Brian, you can go right ahead. Okay, so obviously everybody's kind of been watching the news and trying to wonder what's going on. And, uh, and by the way, I'm the uh, Ag Finance Specialist for NDSU in our Department of Agribusiness and work for Extension. And so I'm just gonna do a kind of a hit the, uh, some key points with what's, what's going on. So on a, a, my first slide there, what we, this just puts into context exactly what's happened in the uh, stock market the last over the course of the last month relative to history. And basically we see the top 15 worst days on record. Uh, three of them happened in March. Um, that includes the great depression. In fact, uh, the 16th of March was the second worst day of all time, uh, just behind uh, the 19th in, in 19, October 19th in 1987. And then on the right hand side, worst weeks, uh, two of the top 15 worst weeks happened this last March. And then uh, the week ending the 15th was the uh, 21st worst week. So uh, for the most part, about 35% of uh, the stock market's high has been wiped away. It's about 60 or so percent of where it was uh, just a few short weeks ago. So this is kind of showing what the market and the, the some of the, I don't want to say panic, but concern that's rippling through everything uh, and, and how it's going to affect uh, many industries, including uh, the restaurant business, hospitality and hotels have been furloughing and laying people off. Uh, we, especially in these states like New York and, and uh, California that have these shelter in place orders going. So on my next slide, it pretty much shows what's happened with interest rates. And I, I try to tie some of this to ag, but we, we all know the Fed has cut rates, they're injecting liquidity into the system, and yet interest rates are going up. This shows the 30-year mortgage rate. Generally, theory would say that these rate cuts would actually lower interest rates, but a couple of things are happening right now. Number one, uh, businesses are running to cash because they're worried about making payroll, they're worried about how they're going to stay afloat over the next few months. So when you run to cash, that tends to increase the demand for dollars, which increases the interest rate. And the other thing is, is uh, basically risk, uh, concern for what's coming. And uh, so the risk premium that goes, that's a portion of any interest rate or any uh, cost of borrowing, uh, that risk premium is getting higher be, uh, because of all the uncertainty surrounding driving, driving rates up. And then on my next slide, I show, we, we talked about the yield curve and how it had inverted. And you can see that it has steepened dramatically over the course of the, the, the last month, be, again, because of this, the Fed cutting rates so dramatically and uh, a lot of uncertainty in the, in the short run. All right, so there's a, uh, my next slide shows that there's this, a company out there that's rating industries based on uh, their exposure to China, how, how tightly they're tied to China possible problems in the supply chain. And then the business environment portion is talking about uh, domestic, essentially. And so they rate the risk of uh, future problems and, and going forward, how vulnerable they might be to potential bankruptcy or serious financial strain, uh, layoffs, those kind of things. And the top section of the table shows some of the industries I already mentioned that have been mentioned a lot, like food, uh, fast food, that is, restaurants, travel agencies, things to that nature, uh, and they're, ex they're uh, extremely vulnerable. Now, at the bottom half of the table is ag and oil, of course. Uh, I put that in there for North Dakota, and a lot of medium and high risk in there uh, of problems down the road for these, for these specific industries, um, and you'll notice one of them is ag banks, and that just changed in the last day, be the concern being that 
if folks, if, if we have problems, uh, people losing their job or, or lower prices going forward, um, how is that going to affect the, the banking system? You know, for instance, just taking into account, uh, if somebody loses their job and they work at a, a restaurant, uh, are they going to be able to make their credit card payments? Are they going to be able to pay rent? Are they going to be able to make their car payment? And so any of these lending institutions that have lent money to those individuals uh, could be could be in big trouble down the road. And sort of that's what this is, this is showing. So with that, I'll uh, kind of turn it over to, uh, I believe, Fran Olson's coming next and uh, await the questions uh, at the end. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this is Frayne Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, this is my contact information. So if there's something that comes up later that you want to talk about privately, feel free to email or, or to call. Uh, my first slide, I just wanted to try and, and put a recap on from an ag market standpoint, specifically from the, the cropping standpoint, you know, what are we looking at right now? And one of the challenges, this is really becomes a psychological battle at this point. Um, we're, we're unsure what the underlying supply demand conditions are. We really have no reference points in history that we can look to to say, well, what is similar? What is, what is a proxy year that we might be able to use as, as a reference point? And we really don't have anything. And as a result, what's happening is the market traders, in particular in, in the grain markets, but also in the equity markets, in the a stock market in the energy markets are really trying to figure out, well, what is the worst possible scenario? And they're preparing for the worst case scenario because we don't have any reference points. So psychologically, this gets to be the, the big challenge for us. And in my view, in my opinion, that we won't, there will continue to be some downward pressure on prices. Again, I'm looking at prices broadly um, until it looks like the number of new cases has begun to drop or begun to drop off. And the reason I'm using that as kind of the reference point of the benchmark is that at that point, once we see the number of new cases of COVID-19 dropping off, then people will say, well, now we know what the worst has looked like. We're, we're, it looks like we're over the hump. It looks like we're in this rebuilding mode and we can start planning for the future. Our time horizon for planning becomes much, much longer. Because again, when we get into high levels of uncertainty, our planning horizons get very, very, very short. Um, so now instead of thinking six months forward, a lot of people are thinking one or two weeks forward. So I'm looking as at, at this, this downturn in the number of new cases in the U.S. as being kind of that tipping point, that trigger point to where, we're, where psychologically the market is going to start looking at the things differently. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is in, in my viewpoint, and, and I know Tim will follow up, in my viewpoint, the grain markets as well as the energy markets will start to rebound after that point. Um, and in my view, the, the grain markets will probably be the quickest to rebound, start rebuilding some strength. We've already seen some rebuilding going on right now, um, which I'll talk about in more, in more detail. But in my view, it'll take a little bit longer for the livestock prices, in particular meat complex, to try and rebound simply because of, of the dynamics going on in the meat markets. And again, Tim will talk about that, that briefly. Uh, my next slide, uh, I get some questions about the US dollar index and the impact that that might have on exports. Um, what I did was I prepared a chart and I grabbed this chart this morning. Um, the US dollar index at about eight o'clock or 8.15 this morning was about 102. And again, realize this is an index. So it's the value of the US dollar relative to a bundle of other currencies. Uh, and there's some concern about as, as our dollar strengthens, it becomes more difficult for us to export things in the global market. It makes it easier as a consumer to buy things, but it makes it more, more difficult and, and more expensive to sell things. Um, I did want to put this in historical perspective that if, if you look at the rates we're looking at right now, there tends, looks like there's kind of a support or resistance line at about 102, 103. We're touching that right now. Um, we have to go back quite a ways. We actually have to go back into the early 2000s to find a dollar index that was higher. And again, just as a reference point, the, um, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, you can see where that is on the graphic. Um, the, re the high numbers that we saw, especially going into the 2000, uh, 2001 time period, that was really the 9-11 event. So what tends to happen, because the US dollar is the currency basically the dominant currency in world trade and is considered still to be the most stable currency. Um, 
there's a, a rush to buying or trying to get your investments into US dollars. And because the demand is increasing, of course, the price starts to go up. If we, the next slide, if we click into uh, what's happening within the corn markets, let's look at old, uh, this is old crop corn. So this would be the value of the corn in the bin. We're looking at the May contract. Um, it, it looks as though we've set a, a low at about 3.30 on the futures. Um, again, this was this snapshot was taken about eight o'clock this morning as we're during that morning break before the, the, the day trading started. Um, right now, May corn is trading at about the same level, 344. So we have seen a little bit of a rebound off the bottom. Some of that is because we're starting to see some buying interest. I mean, the values that we have right now in the futures market, this, these are some real buying opportunities. We're starting to see some countries come in and purchase small amounts to make sure that they have the supply chains um, in, in place as, as we move through this crisis. Uh, we did get notice that China did come in and buy a little bit of um, U.S. soybeans. Uh, on Friday, they also purchased a little bit of U.S. winter wheat, which is the first time in, in quite a few years that they bought U.S. winter wheat. So we're starting to see this demand-based um, uh, building, which is a good thing because, again, these are, these are value opportunities. The next slide would be for this May soybean futures. Again, it's a very similar chart where we saw the, the low. We've seen a pretty strong rebound. Uh, right now, we're trading about up 19, so we're at about three, um, 882 on the futures today or right now. Um, so we're, we're, we continue to rebound some of the soybean charts. One of the questions I get, of course, is how high will this go? If we get a rebound, where's the first level that we're going to start to run into some, some resistance? Those blue lines that I put in there are the support and resistance lines. So think of those as the psychological barriers to price movement. As prices come up, where's the first blockage point that we might start running into some trouble? On, on the May soybean futures, it looks like about 890 is kind of that topping point. So if there is a rally, that'll be the first time that we start to test those psychological boundaries and say, is this getting, given everything we know today, is this getting overvalued? The last, next slide, or basically the last slide in my set was for hard red spring wheat. And again, part of the rally that we've seen in spring wheat is because of the purchase that China made of, of U.S. hard red winter wheat. Um, China has not purchased uh, uh, U.S. wheat since about 2017, at least not in significant amounts. And so the fact that they're coming in and buying some U.S. wheat, there is a slight preference from the Chinese buyers to, to look at a spring wheat instead of a winter wheat. I think the reason they chose the hard red winter wheat was mainly because that was is, um, is valued a little bit more um, at, at a better buy right now than the spring wheat is just because of the relative prices. Um, so just as a real snapshot, again, I think the next up, upward resistance in the spring wheat market would be about that 540 mark. So we can see some rebuilding. We're starting to see a little bit of that with some value purchases, but there's uh, uh, the longer term trend in my view is still have some, some upward, some downward pressure, excuse me, just because of the economic conditions we're going through right now. So with that, I'll um, be quiet and we'll be looking forward to your questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, you see my email address there if you want to uh, get a hold of me. Also, you see my website there. I'm only going to show you two slides today, but I have many, many slides and other presentations on my website. And I will be updating these two slides periodically that I'm going to show you today. So feel free to... Uh, go to my website. Also, I am only going to show you two uh, cattle market class slides. I realize that there are very, other very, very important livestock species and market classes in North Dakota. So again, if you have questions on those, uh, please leave those to the end and, and uh, I will try to answer them then. So go to the first slide is uh, 550 to 600 pound steer calves in North Dakota. We have uh, uh, USDA reports four markets in North Dakota, and that is Dickinson, Mandan, Napoleon, and West Fargo. So these are just averages for those markets. And bear in mind, there's a wide range in prices that do occur for the same market class. So these are just averages. And uh, I like to put the last three years on a chart because if it's happened in the last three years, it could happen again. And I think really sets the stage there. So to begin with, you see that I've highlighted that calf prices uh, usually do uh, peak out seasonally at the end of April, end of May, and they were at 180 the last three years, and we were certainly going to do that again this year. In fact, at my meetings, I've been asking producers to predict the price, and I have this on there. So, well, you know, we were right on track to do that. Um, 
uh, just a month ago, we were at uh, 177, 178, and you know all the fundamentals were really good there. But you see what's happened to the market for all those reasons that Brian talked about the stock market and the uncertainty about beef demand and so on and so on that I won't repeat. So if you have these lighter weight calves to sell now, obviously you're looking at at lower prices. There are really no good marketing strategies to use now, and you know probably have to switch more to financial strategies and working with your uh, lender and so on and, and what you're going to do there because so, pre-pricing opportunities are, are over with. But anyway, uh, one thing about calves just being born now, looking ahead to fall, is we do have some time to buy there. What's going to happen between now and then, and, you know, anybody's guess. But uh, Hopefully the pandemic and all the hysteric will be over. And I, I agree with Frayne completely. It might be slower on livestock, but that is a long way off. But again, I think what we have to do for fall is kind of prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We were looking for sure with the fundamentals that we had with fewer uh, calves to sell and strong export domestic demand and, and so on that we would have uh, been at least up to the blue line there, 2018 levels this fall, maybe even up to 2017 levels. And now it's anybody's guess. They could even be lower than they were last year, which was not the best year. But, you know, again, we've got to hope for the best year and that they will improve. But again, uh, work with your financial institution. And if it, they're similar to last year or lower, um, you know, what can you do there? So go to this. Last slide. These are for the heavier weight yearlings and uh, which would be backgrounding cattle selling now. And again, we did sell quite a few of these into January and February like we always do, but March is a big month. And unfortunately, again, there you see the red line that prices uh, uh, fell dramatically in the last month because of all the issues that uh, Brian talked about. So again, you know, for calves being sold now, the marketing strategy is over and we just start dealing with lower prices and, and uh, no good options there. The, the square uh, dots across the bottom are the feeder cattle futures market, which aligns with the 800 pound cattle. If you go back and go up from uh, January at the beginning of the chart, you see there in, uh, in um, at the end of January, the feeder cattle futures market closed about 141, and that was right on with what cash cattle in North Dakota were on the average. And so those uh, squares would would uh, very much correspond to North Dakota prices. And again, we came off quite a bit there. A little on the futures market. It is up the limit today. I'm just looking at the screen now at 450, and it was up the limit on Friday. And um, one of the obvious reasons, and it's the same way on the live cattle, the fed cattle side is, is that the uh, futures market overreacted to the cash market and is below the cash market. So, you know, you can add another 450 onto those squares across there. So we're up in the mid 20s for the nearby. We're actually up to 132 over that line for the fall futures, but much below uh, uh, last year. And um, just a month ago, feeder cattle futures were up at 155. So you see what they were on Friday, just add 450, but very significantly low, similar to the charts that uh, Dr. Olson showed on the grain side. So we have a wide range of possibilities for this fall again, and we could improve. And, uh, and uh, you know, beef production is at record levels now, but by the end of the year, it's going to, to uh, be reduced some. And, and uh, uh, again, the fundamentals were so good just a month ago. And, and uh, so it all depends on what happens to beef demand, certainly all the sporting events and so on, the closing of motels and travel is not good for, for beef demand. And we'll just have to see how that pans out. The beef demand now in the short run, obviously is very, very good because shelves are empty and so on, but that's probably uh, gonna be a short run deal. So again, just uh, a lot of, not many marketing strategies that you can use now and more financial strategies and working with your lender and so at this time, I'll just wait for questions at the end and turn it over to David Ripplinger, our bioenergy economist. Great, thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, a bioproducts, bioenergy economic specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, just to kind of start uh, on my first slide. 
uh, just to talk about some of the key factors uh, that are going on. Uh, first, it's really important to note that the, the energy market has already started a downturn before uh, the recent activity here in the United States in the last week or two uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, China was hit early on in January with, with COVID-19. And as the, the world's second largest economy, there's concern about their energy use and broader uh, global economic impacts. Uh, in response to that, again, primarily the, the Chinese impact, uh, Saudi Arabia, OPEC, and Russia uh, had, er, had discussions about how they were going to address uh, this uh, oversupply. And typically, you can go one of two ways. Uh, one would be obviously be to, to reduce supply. Uh, to, to help prices rise to, to kind of equal things out uh, with demand. Uh, they couldn't reach an agreement, and so that was about two and a half weeks ago. Uh, and essentially what's happened is Saudi Arabia, uh, the Gulf states, and Russia have all decided that they're going to uh, produce as much oil as they can uh, with the intent of lowering prices and damaging uh, everyone else at the table, uh, including themselves. Uh, and again, that was two and a half weeks ago. Now we're really seeing here in the United States as, as COVID-19 is starting to uh, materialize is uh, the expectation of significant reduction in, in, in fuel use, uh, you know, both gasoline, which is primarily a passenger fuel, as well as diesel on the freight side. You know, as Frank spoke about, uh, we're in this place where there is no technical support. If you look at the charts, you have to go back 20 years or more to find a time where prices have been this low. For a variety of energy pro products and so we can't go back and say hey this is what it looked like recently and so you know we have that point of reference and that you know that's really been the case now for for a few days especially for gasoline with the RBOB contract is uh, the, the benchmark for that and right now it's trading under 50 cents a gallon you know a month ago it was at a dollar 60 or so so I mean that's fallen by two-thirds and again, there's just a lot of uncertainty in terms of what actual fuel use will be. Um, it's important to know too that the RBOB contract is for New York Harbor, and obviously New York City is one of the, the most affected parts of our country right now. So my next slide, uh, just to talk about how kind of how the markets responded. Uh, on, on that top half of the slide, it's, it's global cases of COVID-19, which is in red, followed by deaths. Again, different axis, but you see how that behavior results. If you actually kind of walk through that, you know, the numbers kind of came up uh, and then kind of plateaued around the 12th of February. And that was when China got control of COVID-19 by locking down Hubei province and much of the rest of the country. And in the last two weeks, much of that growth has been coming from Italy, uh, both in terms of cases and deaths. And now as we uh, increase the amount of testing in the United States, we're clearly seeing that here. You know, going down to the bottom half, I have WTI, which is the the U.S. benchmark for oil, uh, which is in which is in orange, and then the the blue uh, line is the ethanol spot price. It's the Chicago or Argus price uh, for ethanol, and as you can see, there's been a significant decline in both of those. Uh, but oil in general has taken a bigger hit. Uh, ethanol has been somewhat resilient, but almost the same way that you have to think about the local market for Arbob in New York Harbor, you have to think about the actual local demand for ethanol. Uh, most of the prices in the region, the spot prices here in the Dakotas and Minnesota have been higher than this uh, to a point where uh, firms might still be breaking even or were break even, breaking even last week. Uh, and so that's good news. And of course, the question is, how are these things going to catch up uh, and, and to what level of severity? Uh, on the next slide, uh, just to talk a little bit about kind of what my expectations are uh, in me and everybody else, an extension of everybody's kind of had this conversation is, you know, what is, what's going to happen here in the, the near term, which I just call second quarter of 2020, which starts on April 1. Uh, you know, there's going to be a significant uh, and immediate reduction in fuel use and exports, uh, which is going to, you know, echo. And, you know, we have refineries up, they're producing, you don't necessarily want to shut down. And so I don't know if we're going to ratchet back fast enough, which again is going to result in, in significant oversupply and lower prices. Uh, my next point, which I think uh, is pretty important, is just to think about uh, how severe and how long this situation might last and what it could mean to the corn ethanol industry specifically, but also how it reverberates through the rest of agriculture. And again, these are just some thoughts in terms of how, how bad and how long the situation might be. Uh, and then to measure it in terms of the amount of acres that we would dedicate to corn that would be used for ethanol that would be lost. 
And so, for example, if, if, if what we have right now lasts for four months, and I actually did increase these numbers and my expectations from Friday quite a bit, um, you know, if it lasts for four months and there's about a 20% decline in, in gasoline use, uh, and consequently a, a 20% decline in, in U.S. corn ethanol consumption, you know, that equates to about 2 million acres uh, lost for the year. And again, would that come off of old crop or new crop, uh, you know, that's what's going to play into to the longer scenarios. Uh, and of course, as you lengthen the duration uh, and increase the severity, it obviously can be a, a number of acres. So if this is going to last for all of 2020 and a 25% reduction, which I do not think is the worst case scenario, you know, we'd be talking about a loss of about a fourth of the, the corn acres used for ethanol, which is about seven and a half million acres. Uh, also talking just about expectations, you know, energy can respond. It's a very liquid uh, market, but you know, it's really going to go. And this is kind of based on our experience with the the financial uh, recession, the 2018, or excuse me, the 2008 recession, the financial crisis. You know, traditionally, transportation follows GDP, fuel use follows uh, miles traveled. And, you know, it, it, a lot of this is just going to depend on how the market as a whole reacts, how the economy reacts. You know, we're going to see unemployment numbers. We're going to see some immediate significant changes. And while I, I'm confident we'll, you know, we'll catch our feet and, and begin to grow as early as the, the third quarter, uh, you know, it's going to take, you know, likely years to get back to the same level of GDP uh, and then consequently the same amount of fuel use. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, it's time for Q&A. So if you have a question, you can use the chat or you can also text the number on the screen or the email address. And then our gentleman here will answer your questions. As we're waiting for the first question to come in, do you guys have any additional thoughts as maybe the next person was speaking that you went, oh yeah, I should have mentioned this? Um, if, if I can make one, one brief comment, I guess to springboard off a few things David had said. Um, also one of the questions I'm getting from, from farmers as well as some of the ag press is, well, Two, two parts. What do you do with the old crop? I focused a little bit on the old crop pricing and what's going on in the value of the stuff that's in the bin. But as we move into spring planting now, the question is, well, should farmers change their planting intentions or should they modify what they're expected to plant this spring based on the, what we have today? And, and my recommendation at this point is to not change those. Um, if we look at the price relationships in the marketplace right now, there is a slight advantage to planting additional corn acres. But as David pointed out, um, there's some, some questions about the longer term demand base and how quickly the ethanol, um, ethanol industry can re rebound out of, out of these downturn. So I would, at this stage of the game, not change my planting intentions based off today's price levels. Um, it, again, it, it is a benchmark, but given all the level of uncertainty and the extremely short planning horizons that most people have right now and the rapidly changing um, env economic environment, um, I, I, my recommendation to farmers is, nope, keep the plan in place. Um, obviously, the economics is a big portion, but you also have to look at uh, what is the, the weed control issues, what's your rotation system, um, how many acres you're actually going to get seeded this spring. Um, obviously, spring melt and, and potential flooding is also going to play into that role. So I would not change my 2020 planting intentions based on what I see in the marketplace today. I see a question there from, I believe, Todd Neely on uh, inputs. My, uh, my brother, is a, he works for a very large co-op in, in Nebraska, a farmer's co-op, and that's his job is sourcing inputs and then turning around and selling them uh, retail to farmers. And so far, he's told me he hasn't had any hiccups in the supply chain of sourcing inputs. And, and in fact, they're trying to decide uh, how much fuel to buy to completely fill their coffers and at what point, like in other words, you know, Dave, Dave can probably address where he thinks the bottom is, but they're, they're trying to guess that too. And so a lot of businesses that are sourcing ag inputs, including uh, fertilizer, uh, NH3, 
uh, uh, urea, those kind of things. Where's the bottom and, and uh, when should they stock up? But as far as he said, um, the, the supplies continue to be there. The ability to source it is there. Uh, it's a lot better than last year because they're not having these barge and flooding issues of getting need to be. Uh, you know, Nebraska and Iowa and those guys are, are several weeks ahead of us in terms of their planting season. And so far, so good. Um, I don't know how much of that's going to be maybe translated on to you, the farmer, in terms of lower costs uh, as these as these uh, fuel supplies and, and things like that are uh, less expensive. But I don't anticipate any input problems right now. Uh, it sounds like that the that, that that supply chain is is solid and and will continue to be uh, going forward. That's that's my take. But again, th this environment is changing so fast that I I can't. I, I we're we're trying to basically look out weeks and weeks and and uh, thing, things change rapidly. But so far so good on that. We have a question that was just before that. Uh, Tyson added five dollars to fat cattle purchases. How yeah, is I'll take that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tyson's adding five dollars on, so certainly that'll uh, help cattle prices, the fed cattle prices this week, and the other packers will follow along. Again, this is kind of a short-term deal, and that the shelves are getting bare around a lot of places for beef, and we're trying to funnel beef out of the hotel restaurant back into the retail chain, and so on. And obviously, one of the uh, things that the price system is supposed to do is prevent shortages or surpluses and right now there's a shortage at the retail level so prices are going up there and and uh, to ration the product and also following the fed cattle but again our concern is into the future and uh, you know how long is this thing going to last and no travel and no sporting events and all that how is that going to affect demand into the future so in the short run and you see the futures markets up to the limit today so you know, that's a, a short run thing and, and, and prices are going to be higher this week, but our concern is the, is the longer term. See another question there while I'm on a, a, a question about dairy and uh, same thing is for all the livestock and dairy that I talked about just in cattle as we've seen price declines now and, and uh, how, how is demand going to be affected in the future? We were looking at a quite a bit better year for dairy this year and prices did come up and, and now the, the futures market there too has been going down. So just concern about, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the economy and people and, uh, again, a lot of dairy products sold at the hotel restaurant uh, business. And so no answers, just many, many questions, but uh, the, the uh, entire meat dairy complex is struggling with what is demand going to be. And David, do you see there's a, a question about fuel supply and any thoughts on biodiesel industry? Yeah, both really good questions. So obviously right now we're not seeing any disruptions in, in either the gasoline or diesel uh, supply change. Don't really expect that. I know that farmers have, have begun pricing uh, some, some of their, their, their fuel for, for spring work. And again, you know, that, that general marketing principles, again, if you can lock in a low price, you know, you, you can sit and say, is it going to get lower or higher? Um, you know, I, I don't know if you're going to see significantly better prices again in our lifetime. So again, in, in some respects, that's like the only silver lining in this broader situation uh, are, are those low, lower fuel prices. Uh, in, in terms of biodiesel, it, it's going to be really interesting because what we're seeing now is, you know, it, it, the, the problem is a, a significant shift in demand. And so this is obviously hitting both the renewable side and the fossil fuel side. And there's excess, there, there is now excess capacity in both oil refining and in biodiesel refining or, or in corn ethanol refining. And it, it's gonna be troublesome. And again, it, bio diesel consumption is actually pretty easy to estimate. Uh, again, in terms of its relationship with GDP, we're gonna see a hit in GDP, we're gonna be I think for the most part, you know, moving a lot met less material, a lot less freight activity in the second quarter. And that's going to hit both diesel and biodiesel pretty significantly. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the thoughts you might have as a solution would be, well, let's just increase the biodiesel blend rate again, because there's no blend wall. Again, the, the challenge with that is the, the petroleum industry is going to fight that tooth and nail because they're really going to be giving up 
part of that tank at a time when they, they don't want to give up anything else because it is uh, such a difficult situation. Rain, here's one for you. Can we move the low quality corn or is that going to cause even more problems? Um, so the, the, it depends upon how low quality you're talking. <laughs> um, the ethanol industry, at least the local ethanol in market has been, um, taking up some of our lower quality, uh, corn, the lower test weight corn. Uh, some of the low test weight corn has also been going to the feedlots and what the feedlot folks are doing is they're taking uh, a train load of the low pro, a uh, low, excuse me, low test weight corn that we have here in, in the Dakotas. They're blending it with some of the higher test weight corn that they've got coming out of Western Kansas, Western Nebraska, and they're coming up with the feed ration they need. And so from the ethanol standpoint, as David was saying, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on, on those folks to try and increase efficiency as much as possible, meaning there'll be, if they're going to discount for low test weight corn, they'll likely increase their discounts just because the conversion rates aren't as strong. For the feedlot sector, again, Tim may want to jump in and comment on this, but um, for, for the feedlots, of course, they have the number of animals in the lots right now. They need to be fed. Uh, the question is how quickly can they refill them and at what weights are they going to try and bring them into the feedlot at? And so that one's a little shakier. Um, I do think there'll be some, some, again, pressure on light test weight corn throughout the rest of the summer just because there's so much of it into the marketplace right now. Tim, uh, you have a question. Um, have you seen anything from the other major packers regarding a similar offer? Yeah, I think that, that'll go along. I haven't seen any announcements on others, and this was just kind of an add-on, but that, that raises the price. And so, you know, I think whether you add on or the price level goes up this week, that's the case. I see another question of, you know, how will beef demand compared to chicken and pork? And obviously, uh, beef is the highest priced meat item. We have record production of beef, pork, and poultry. And so uh, all of those are very dependent on the hotel restaurant trade that, uh, you know, is, is getting less and less every day. And uh, again, the big demand at the retail now, and how does that uh, carry through? And so, you know, it, you know, we just got to wait and see here how consumers react and so on. But yes, beef is the highest priced item. And so that could be uh, impacted more. Uh, uh, another question about will there be any support for cattle or livestock producers? And again, uh, I have no idea there. The uh, government right now is, is debating a $2 trillion package and uh, and only hogs and dairy were involved with MFP payments. And so uh, this is a whole different story. And so uh, Brian maybe can talk more about it with $2 trillion and do we have another one and how many, what happens in Congress? So I can't answer that, but uh, I know um, many senators have uh, indicated the livestock situation to the Secretary of Agriculture and the president. So we will have to wait and see there. Yeah, and there's there's another one. Does it make sense for for cow calf producers to hold on to their calves for say another sixty days to hope the market will rebound? Yeah, okay, that's uh, it is kind of risky, and I can't answer that. Nobody knows what prices are going to do. But again, uh, if, if we struggle on the demand side, and again, half the beef uh, goes into the hotel, restaurant, institution sector, and we're trying to move that over into the retail level, but. Uh, uh, again, when reality comes and we're, you know, with the NCAA and all the other stuff where we sold a lot of meat, there certainly is downward uh, chances for cattle prices on out. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, I just can't answer that. It, it could, uh, it, there is still a chance of downward pressure. So you, I think you have to discuss that with your lender and, uh, and see what this, that the situation might be there. And, and to kind of to tack on with, with Tim, there's a estimates out there of a second quarter contraction all the way up to 30% of uh, GDP. Basically that's kind of uh, that would, that actually came out from a, a federal reserve uh, banker out of uh, Philadelphia. Goldman Sachs has come out and said 25% 
um, and that was days ago. And it's actually people are revising these 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 market analysts are revising them every day as conditions continue to deteriorate. And uh, like Tim said, the most vulnerable sectors for what's going on right now are the ones that are going to heavily influence meat prices. Uh, you you can't shut down every steakhouse in New York who are the people who tend to buy box beef cuts, the most expensive cuts, and they're not serving them. And our general economic theory says that when incomes go down or, or, or we have a recession, like I, I don't want to use the term recession because that has a very technical definition, but contractions like they're talking about, um, there's just no way that it's not going to impact these things dr dramatically. And people tend to buy cheaper if they're worried about their jobs, if they're worried about income, if they're worried about it down the line, even people who maintain, keep their jobs and aren't necessarily that worried about losing them. We tend to start pinching pennies. They're, they're going to, they're going to buy the cheapest cuts of meat, uh, the cheapest food in general that they can get their hands on uh, and save as much as they can going forward. And then we have, how is this going to affect the, the credit markets? Uh, Tim brought up, you know, I, I see some questions streaming here on government relief. Yeah, there's been our senators who've, who've brought these uh, concerns or bringing up these concerns for farmers. Right now, there isn't a lot of talk of that. And it could come in, in several different forms, one being the MFP style direct payments that, that, uh, that, that we received last year. Uh, another one might be uh, basically loan programs to commercial lenders who will, the government will guarantee loans that they normally, lenders might not have made in, uh, based on some of the cash flow problems that, that, that might be being faced by our farmers. There might be some government backed uh, loan programs, right, for higher risk loans. So FSA getting involved and in, in making these kind of things or the, the triple C coming in and, and doing some sort of relief there. We, we just don't know. I, I would be, I would be surprised if myself and I, I, and these guys can agree or not, I would be surprised if there isn't some form of help coming as, but as far as who gets it and how much that's, that's impossible to say, but the numbers they're throwing around trillions with a, with a T with a big capital T Compared to that $14.5 billion MFP last year, that's a drop in the bucket uh, with the numbers they're throwing around right now. So I, I'm hopeful. I think that there probably will be, but in, in what form it comes, it, it's, it's really tough for us to say right now that the conditions are changing so fast. And I, I saw another question just real quick while I'm on about fertilizer prices. Uh, again, I, I kind of addressed that a, a minute ago, but it, I don't see this necessarily affecting fertilizer prices and input costs. They're, I'm not saying that they're not going to move up or down, but I, I don't think it will necessarily be because of this. Those supply chains are, are robust. Uh, the people that I know that are in the industry are having no problems sourcing fuels and fertilizers and herbicides and things like that. And they were ready for the planting season. Uh, you know, before all this happened, they already had a lot of that stuff uh, sorted out. So. I don't see that this impacting uh, your ability to either secure inputs or the, the price on those inputs dramatically. And in fact, it, if anything, you may see them go down because of things Dave has mentioned about fuel prices. In terms of soybean and wheat production, how are other countries doing? Um, okay, so let's take those in, in two different pieces. In soybeans, uh, the basically the three largest producers of soybean globally, um, the US and Brazil, which are approximately the same size and then Argentina. Of course, we're going into our planting season. Um, the expectation now is that our soybean plantings will obviously be up from last year, but down from, the, the, from two years ago. Um, so we're gonna, looking at, a, because of the carryover stocks of soybeans from, from old crop. Um, on the wheat side, okay, so back up on the soybeans, Argentina and Brazil are both going to have very, very large crops. Uh, the Brazilian crop is nearing the end of its, its maturity. It, most of it's been harvested. The Argentine crop, there has been a few dry spots in it, and, and kind of the top end is coming off some of the yield expectations. But they're still going to have a very, very good year um, in, in South America. And that's going to put some pressure not only on old crop soybeans, but also put kind of a cap on any kind of new crop rallies we may be able to get. 
On the wheat side, most of the wheat, the vast majority of the wheat we grow globally is in the Northern Hemisphere. And so their production cycle is very similar to what we have in the United States. So for example, the Black Sea region of Argentina and I mean, of, of Ukraine and Russia have a very similar uh, production cycle to let's say in Oklahoma or a, or a Kansas here for their wheat production, their winter wheat production. Um, right now it looks like uh, most of the regions globally for wheat production with the exception of, of Australia are in pretty good shape. Um, there are a few issues starting to show up in, in Russia, but again, they're relatively minor at this point. Um, there's a few spots in parts of Europe where the winter wheat crop looks like it might be under some stress, but uh, global supplies of, of both wheat and soybeans look to be very adequate for the foreseeable future. Brain, any thoughts on what's in store for basis levels and local cash bids for both old crop and new crop, all grains? Okay, so we did see as, as this coronavirus uh, started to evolve, we did see a, a slight weakening of the basis levels for corn, in particular corn delivery into the ethanol system. Um, I don't anticipate major uh, drops in basis levels. Um, we also had a question related to that about China buying U.S. commodities and what about our port facilities and any, any threats of shutting down the port facilities from an export standpoint. Um, if we did see some, some issues at the port levels where um, port workers were either ordered to stay home or, or there was in Brazil, I mean, yeah, in both Brazil and Argentina now, there's discussions about strikes by the port workers because of coronavirus and concerns about um, being infected as they're loading and unloading vessels. We haven't seen that in the US yet, but if there was some kind of supply disruption, in particular at the port levels, obviously local basis levels would respond and respond fairly quickly. Now, I don't anticipate that happening. Uh, I, I don't see it happening right now, uh, but it is a possibility. Now, if we do not have a disruption in the supply chain, I really don't see the basis levels um, crashing and crashing dr dramatically. We may see, again, some downward pressure um, I don't see at this price level in the futures market, the farmers are going to have a lot of selling activity. Most farmers that I know of are not really thrilled with these price levels. So the inflow of grain into the system will be relatively muted, which should maintain basis levels, at least within uh, my guess, my anticipation within, within the next month or so. Thoughts on MFP3? I, I know Brian touched on that a little bit. Um, I think it's a possibility whether it's part of this big stimulus package that's being negotiated right now or not, I don't know. Um, that's being put together fairly quickly. I think the focus is primarily on industry level support for the, the hospitality and airlines and, and, and uh, cruise ship industries as well as trying to get some um, immediate cash relief for those that are um, facing unemployment or those that are concerned about their jobs. Whether agriculture is part of that um, that's bailout or stimulus package, we don't know. Um, I think it is likely, given all the things that are going on, I, I think the probability went up. But again, I have not heard anything through the grapevine about a formal MFP3 3.0 kind of uh, program or payments. Yeah, I, I, I uh, scoured you know the news to try to find any mention of an MFP3. Uh, other than it being somewhat discussed by uh, uh, members of, of Congress and whatnot, I I don't I haven't seen anything. And I read a uh, the 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 phase three actually has a outline of the things that they're going to address. And of course, that's changing probably right now. Uh, but I didn't see any mention of agriculture really in there. A lot of it, you know. But technically speaking, I mean, ag is small businesses. So I don't know if the small business liquidity that they are pumping into it would uh, go towards agriculture as well, or if there's, or if it's going to have its own bill, because it, it may be a scenario where uh, ag banks are, are able to access some of those funds. And maybe there's, there's the ability for farmers to take advantage of some of these uh, loan programs through the SBA. I know that that's encouraged in some states where where uh, farmers use SBA loans. And are they going to be loans that are then forgiven, or are they going to be just 
you know, are you going to be on the hook for the payments in the future? A lot of that's all up in the air right now is it, it and it's changing by the, by the minute. So that's, that's kind of where we sit there. I, I hate to say, yes, we're going to get an MFP or no, we're not going to get an MFP because we just don't know what it's going to look like. But I, I do believe there will be something. I just, we just don't know what it is. Brain, do you see even more possible preventative planning acres happening this year because of wet conditions and of course the fear of the market presently? Yeah, I, one of the things we saw last last spring when when it looked like Prevent Plant was going to be a very very large portion of our of our U.S. acreage, we saw quite a rally, especially in the corn market, to try and provide that incentive for farmers to keep planting. In today's environment, we do quick back of the envelope math on Prevent Plant. Um, prevent Plant is always kind of a second best choice in most farmers' minds. They'd rather plant a crop, but when you do the economics on it with today's price levels. Uh, again, I want to be cautious about making decisions with today's futures market prices. But if we you do use that as a reference point and do the math on prevent plant, obviously with the lower prices, prevent plant looks like a better, better scenario. Do I think farmers will dramatically change or or look at prevent planting differently in today's environment? I you know it, I know there's going to be some farmers that 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 may, but I think the majority of them would prefer to plant a crop and not have to deal with the issues about weed control and 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 um, staying within a crop rotation longer term. I finally have a text question here. So this one's also for Frame. You mentioned that the port workers strike. What caused the soybean dust issue in Pakistan in February? Any background on that? Oh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer to. Uh, the Pakistan one, I'm uh, that one. I'm not. I'm not familiar with all the details there. So that one, I can't comment on. I guess the I I will fill in a little bit of blanks on the both the Brazilian and the Argentine um, issues because that came out basically on Friday. Um, in in one of the major ports in Argentina, actually, Argentina has river ports, so they import they the farmers deliver the soybeans into um, uh, these port facilities. The crushing facilities are very very close to the ports where they load the vessels. Um, the, one of those major port areas would be similar to our, um, um, like the Gulf of Mexico. We have multiple companies and multiple cities working along that region. They actually blocked, the, the citizens tried to, or the cities, excuse me, tried to block the Im, import or movement of the trucks into the city to dump the soybeans for processing and, and for export. And so, even though nationally they said, no, you're allowed agricultural products is a, is a priority product. You're allowed to ship it within the country. The cities themselves put the, put the ban on saying, we're not going to allow these trucks in. And so there is a supply chain on reserve right now for a few days. But again, that might run out shortly in, in Argentina. In Brazil, uh, the Brazilian dock workers are going to vote today um, in the city of Santos to try and decide should they go on strike because of concerns about health issues and the coronavirus. Um, I haven't heard anything yet as of this morning on what their vote came out. My guess is it'll be another day or two before we find out. But even, even in Brazil where there's, uh, again, huge volumes of, of beans being shipped right now, the port strike, the port workers are very concerned about their own health and their family's health and are are, are actually considered striking because of it. So this is an, a developing issue. It's something we've got to keep our eyes on for sure. Back to the other question, have you seen guys struggling to get operating credit? I'll start with that one and Brian, maybe you want to jump in or, or Tim or Dave. Um, as of right now, I have not, I mean, the, there's, there's obvious, okay, so back up. Um, the economic conditions coming in for loan renewals was, was a struggle to start with. And I wanna be very careful how I put this. In my discussions with, with ag lenders, they're doing everything possible to be able to rework their loans so that they keep as many people farming and, as much, and provide as much financing as possible. But obviously there's going to be limits and each inst lending institution has their, their line that you can't cross and they say, look, we just can't do this anymore because it's too high risk. So there are farmers that are not going to get financing this spring. Um, to my knowledge, the change because of coronavirus has not yet impacted the lender's ability to provide credit. 
Uh, my understanding, and, and again, I haven't had a lot of conversations recently, but my understanding is that banks are continuing to use the price and price forecasts that they had been using earlier in the winter as they're putting together the cash flows for the 2020 operating line, lines of credit. So to my knowledge, there's not been any adjustment on the lender side to make, make revisions to either existing loans or even the new loan applications, given the drop that we've seen in prices today. Yeah, uh, again, it's most of the cre any credit issues are going back to people who had cash flow issues from previous years. As far as we can tell at the moment, there's not any liquidity problems uh, going through the, the, the banking system and uh, and adding to adding to the the issues that we already had. So at the moment, not any more than you would expect based on um, economic conditions from the previous years. Yeah, there's been some instances that I've heard about where credit is getting tighter for individuals, but it, we're not going to know exactly the impact that this has had for a while. There's a huge lag effect, and so um, we'll continue to continue to monitor it. There's a question about corn acres. How many have got, uh, left to go in North Dakota or Wisconsin today? Um, so I don't have any good numbers out of Wisconsin. Um, the last official numbers that I saw out of USDA NAS for a survey was about 40% remaining. Or uh, actually closer to 30, about, yeah, 40% was the last official number. Um, I know as of about two weeks ago when I talked to um, – Farmers, as well as you know, some of the um, commodity organizations, they figured there's probably a third of the corn that was still left in the field, uh, at least in North Dakota in this region. Um, and and I don't know what's been happening the last week or so because of all the other stuff going on. But I suspect farmers are still trying to plug away um, at getting that cleaned up. So if I were to guess today, I'd say anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of the of the corn crop still remains across the state. But that's just a guesstimate on my part. I think we caught all the questions, but if you guys could kind of scroll up and down and make sure we've covered all the questions, I just want to point out to everybody that we'd really appreciate your feedback on this webinar. I inserted a URL there that you can click on. I promise it's only three questions, very short, sweet, and to the point, but we want to know if this was, was worthwhile for you or not. So if you would provide that feedback, we would really appreciate it. And like I said, if you guys can just kind of scroll up and down and make sure we've answered all the questions. However, we don't want to cut off the discussion. If you think of something, please throw it out there. There was one question that came up to me privately, and I don't know if it was just a, a, a purposeful or a click of the button, but um, it, the question had to do with um, the Federal Reserve and, and, and interest rates and what the Federal Reserve activity is and what I thought might happen to interest rates. And I know Brian and I have talked about this. I'll make a few comments and please feel free to chime in when, when you want to, Brian. Um, you know, we're essentially at anywhere from zero to 0.25% as the federal funds rate right now. And that's the rate that, that large banks will loan money to each other on an overnight basis. So that becomes kind of the starting point for uh, short-term interest rates. Um, the interest rate on your credit card, the interest rate on your operating loan, that's kind of the starting point for that. Um, I really don't anticipate the Federal Reserve going to negative interest rates. I, I just don't see that as a possibility. I know the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Jerome Powell is against that idea. I think most of the Fed governors are against the idea. Right now, there's a more discussion about um, uh, the quantitative easing or essentially having the Federal Reserve try and help buy some of the, the low quality loans off the marketplace to try and provide an additional incentive then for the large banks to continue to loan money. Um, and I do see that, you know, that continuing. Um, I really, and Brian chime in please, I, I really don't anticipate short term interest rates, the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates for an extended period of time. This is gonna take a while for the US economy to rebound and to start growing again and they're going to want to tr try and provide as much stimulus as possible to make that happen. Um, yeah, so uh, as far as them increasing rates, I don't see that happening for years. It, when, when you think about what happened after the 2008 financial crisis, I mean, we stayed at basically 0% interest on the federal funds rate, that is, 
for a very long time, the quantitative easing uh, that went on. And the steps that they're taking now makes what they, the Federal Reserve did in 2008 look small. I mean, the, the amount they're talking about pumping potentially $4 trillion by the time this is all said and done into offering, like Frayne said, the ability to buy up bad debt that they know is going to be bad debt. Um, and, but they're basically, rather than the government sending a, sending a small business owner a check, they offer them a, you know, a, a, a risky loan and then forgive it if it doesn't get, if they can't pay it. I mean, those are the kind of things being kicked around right now. And in order for that to happen, you know, the Federal Reserve has to make money available as does the, the you know, the Treasury. So I don't see interest rates going very high um, in the in the near or medium term future. I mean, I just don't. Now, that's not to say because I showed it a, a chart that that interest rates actually went up in the last month. Because, but you got to remember, interest rates are the federal funds rate plus approximately a three percent prime, and then and then as well as individual risk. So if right now before these uh, the the lenders are able to access a lot of that money. Uh, they have to assess risk and then assign an interest rate accordingly, and it's gone up for that reason. But as far, but they're still historically low. We're still talking about below four percent. We're still talking about three and a half. I'm just saying that th this recent spike is is not not a, a interest rates going higher as far as that goes. Um, so that's 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 what I think about that. Now this was a very different conversation just a year ago. Uh, but but things have things have transpired that and and like Frayne said they're not going to going negative interest rates has historically not been very useful. That that's one reason they're not going to do it. Plus, it sends a pretty bad signal when they do that. Uh, a lot of people react when countries go to negative interest rates that they're basically their economy is totally in the tank. That that's kind of the perception that comes with it. Um, and I just wanted to mention I said it in the chat, but that phase three. A trillion dollar bailout package uh, failed in the Senate once again. So we're seeing the equities market react um, pretty unfavorably right now for because of that. So uh, we'll, I guess we'll see going forward. I do think it's going to get passed. It's just how long is it going to take and uh, what's it going to look like? We, we're not sure. I think we missed one question up a little ways. Just is there anything that we didn't cover that farmers and ranchers need to keep in mind as we navigate the unknowns of the coronavirus? And I would also, not to throw two questions to you guys at once, but also just is there a key message? You've been, all been to my training. Is What's the key message you want to leave people with? What have we forgotten and what are the key messages? Um, I guess I can start while everybody else is trying to collect their thoughts. Um, my big takeaway on, on, on this is, you know, not to panic. Uh, we, we've had a lot. People are adjusting. The situation's um, changing very, very quickly. Um, I, I do think the market in general, whether you're talking the, the grain markets or the livestock markets or the equity markets, um, are, are right now in – because we don't know what's happening, they're thinking worst case scenario. And, and I really don't think that the worst case scenario in people's minds right now are the ones that's actually gonna play out. So um, right now, don't panic. Um, let's, let's think about what's going on, make smart decisions, get as much information as possible before you make a decision, um, and, and, and be very thoughtful about how you move forward. Um, again, so this is not a time to panic. Let's not overreact to what's happening. Let's think through and, and make decisions that are based off of the best information we have. Yeah, and I, I'll just I'll just uh, t tack on with Frame that right now the the situation is changing so fast, and uh, and estimates of long term. Im implications are changing and new ones coming out every single day. Uh, some are like, uh, like Frayne said, with this worst case scenarios of a 30% retraction in GDP. Some are a lot more optimistic, like a 12% retraction in GDP. The, the real, I guess, 
variable is is how long is how long are we going to be operating under the conditions we're operating in right now and the reality is nobody knows um they're they're just estimates uh, uh the treasury secretary had came out yesterday and said 12 weeks that we'll be kind of operating under this self-quarantining cities certain businesses forced to remain shut down those kind of things if it's 12 weeks, that's uh, that's an awful long time. Um, and, and it's going to have long term implications. But again, making decisions based on those kind of uh, speculations is probably uh, not productive simply because again, things are changing so fast that you, you try to plan right now. And, and, and by the time you implement some of these uh, strategies, the, the, the situation's changed on you. So going forward, I think we, you know, we put our heads down and we try to uh, plow ahead as best we can and, and then, you know, react, uh, ac accordingly. Yeah, I would just agree that don't change your marketing plan based on what happens in today or tomorrow in the futures market. I mean, it's going up the limit, down the limit and so on. Last week in cattle futures, some days we had a $10 range in price. They'd be up the limit to begin with and the Dow changes and goes down. So, uh, be very careful to make big changes in marketing plans. We just have to wait this thing out and, and see, and it's very, very unfortunate, but uh, there are way more questions than answers right now. Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> if there's no more questions, we want to thank everybody for joining us today, especially a big thank you to Frayn, Brian, Tim, and Dave for providing so much information. And please click on the feedback form. Like I said, it's only three questions long, but we would greatly appreciate knowing if this was useful, if you would like them to do it again, if you have topics that you'd like to see addressed in the future that they can delve deeper into. So thank you very much for joining us today. The recordings will be on the Agri Business and Applied Economics Extension page and the NDSU Extension Coronavirus website both of those websites. So we'll let you know if we're doing this again with additional topics that you've suggested. Thanks so much for joining us today.